Good morning, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to WKJY, or otherwise known as K98.3, uh, for Health Talk. I'm Dr. Victor Politi. I'm the president and CEO of New Health. That's the Nassau University Medical Center over in uh, East Meadow, Long Island. As healthcare in America is changing, New Health is part of that change. Uh, this program, for approximately a half hour, will provide with you the essential information about our services, facilities that provide top quality care that fits into your lifestyle. Our roots go deep into Long, ha- Long Island's history. What began in 1935 as a 200-bed general hospital has now become part of a unique health organization with multiple centers of care and a commitment to deliver excellent, essential care to everyone at every stage of life. We're absolutely dedicated to being the healthcare institution that makes the full spectrum of world-class services available to all of Nassau County residents. Our improvements are making us a leading provider of primary and tertiary care services that rival the best in the country. To learn more about New Health or its centers of care, please contact New Health at www.newhealth, that's N-U-H-E-A-L-T-H, health.net, or call 516-486-NUMC, NUMC, National University Medical Center, or 6862. So, thank you for being here this morning, um, and we have a really a great guest today, someone that uh, is going to uh, really impart a lot of good information uh, about something that really is life-saving and, and may actually save someone's life. Uh, if someone listens to this program and, and picks up some of these uh, some of the information that we're going to talk about, um, we may actually save someone's life today, and that's what we do this for. And we have Dr. Kaleem. Rizvan, Dr. Kaleem Rizvan, Dr. Rizvan, is the Director of Endoscopy at uh, Nassau University Medical Center, Associate Chief of Gastroenterology. So it's, that's quite a lot to say. But he does work at the hospital. He's one of our staff physicians. He's a, a board-certified, uh, fellowship-trained a gastroenterologist, and he'll explain to us exactly what that is uh, when he speaks, uh, who's really very highly uh, regarded in the hospital. As a matter of fact, um, a lot of... Uh, personal friends, I've referred them to him for uh, for colonoscopies and for examinations and uh, feel very comfortable with him and really I'm very proud to have him in uh, in our hospital. Uh, matter of fact, our hospital has really been going through a lot of changes at Nassau University Medical Center. Uh, people who come in there today really cannot recognize the hospital as it was just a few years ago. Uh, new $30 million uh, emergency medicine ER uh, with all individual rooms. Every room has its own television, its own, you know, it, it really very private. It's no, no longer these curtains between stretches. Um, you actually have a nice private room. The pediatric emergency department is completely separate from the main ER, um, and it's available with a pediatrician um, as well as a board-certified emergency doctor. Um, we've spent just about $25 million on our primary care center, uh, which Dr. Vizon actually works in. It's part of his, uh, <coughs> part of his domain. Uh, it's also for pediatrics. Beautiful, beautiful pediatric area now for the children. Uh, beautiful women's health center. All phases of women's health, um, and the beautiful internal medicine and primary care, which includes all aspects of uh, primary care medicine, as well as many specialties, such as Dr. Rizvan with gastroenterology. Uh, We have an amazing cardiology program, endocrine, um, just about all the subspecialties for any disease process. We, We have specialists that are board certified in those fields available for you just by calling uh, the number that I gave before um, at NUMC um, for an appointment. So uh, world-class ophthalmology services, I mean, some of the best ophthalmology, orthopedics, second to none in Nassau County and probably in New York. It's a really amazing orthopedic group. We do see a lot of trauma um, at NUMC. We are a level one trauma center. So we see a lot of ambulances, a lot of car accidents, a lot of fractures and broken bones. So our orthopedic guys are are tops, believe me. Uh, And they're really on their game. Our operating rooms and our um, our uh, ICUs are really squared away and all all refurbished ICUs, CCUs, um, and that's intensive care unit and coronary care unit. We even uh, opened up a new what we call a SPA, SPA, which is a surgical post-acute area. Uh, that's what the initials stand for. And that's for people that had uh, some sort of incident in the surgical uh, realm in the intensive care unit. And it's sort of a step-down unit that people can go from the intensive care unit. Instead of going to a regular medical surgical floor, 
they get intense treatment in this surgical post-acute area, particularly the elderly. Because we find when elder, elderly people fall, fracture their hip, or have some other injuries, they need a little extra physical medicine. They need a little occupational medicine. They need some extra care before going up to med surge and, and uh, you know being integrated with the rest of the hospital population. So that hospital is absolutely amazing. I've been the CEO there a little over three years, and I, I am so proud to be there. It's really a great hospital, really great people. Um, and we're really uh, making the place uh, really shine in, in Nassau County. And listen, we're lucky in Nassau County. We're surrounded by a lot of great hospitals, a lot of really great healthcare facilities. So the people in Nassau have a great uh, opportunity to go to, to many different hospitals. And we feel that at Nassau University Medical Center, we're one of those hospitals and we're one of those choices uh, that you should be feel to make, free, feel free to make. Uh, and to say that and to expand on that, um, today with Dr. Rizvan, we're going to talk to us about one subspecialty in 19 stories, a million square feet of, uh, of hospital that I have over there, uh, that we have over there. Um, and here we have one doctor who's making a difference in people's lives. So, Dr. Rizvan, thank you very, very much for being here. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, where you, where you went to school and your fellowship and, and, and a little thing about, uh, about Dr. Rizvan. Thank you, Dr. Falidi. Uh, good morning to you, and good morning to your listeners. Uh, I'm really honored to be here on a wonderful uh, morning to talk about an important aspect of uh, the quality of care that's uh, being done at NASA University Medical Center. Uh, I echo all the wonderful things that you said about the medical center. I'm really happy and proud to be part of this uh, amazing institution. I'm originally from India. Uh, I uh, trained at the Madras Medical College, which is one of the oldest medical institutions in India. And uh, my journey to the United States started uh, more than 20 years ago. Back in the day when we didn't have internet, uh, we had to really <laughs> go through different set of textbooks because the medical education in India is geared towards the British medical system uh, with, a, uh, with an ambition to come into the United States and uh, get my postgraduate training. Uh, I had to go through uh, a year of uh, preparation uh, for an examination that at that time was not given in India. So I, I traveled to Singapore uh, and that was about 25 years ago, I had to go through a two-day rigorous examination. Uh, and uh, I think I truly lucked out uh, when I applied to a number of hospitals. NASA University Medical Center, which was NASA County Medical Center, uh, reached out to me uh, with an unexpected opening. Uh, residency programs, as you know, start in the month of July. Uh, it so happened that there was an unexpected opening and I was offered a position uh, to start in January, uh, back in 1993. Uh, and uh, it's been a great learning experience ever since. Uh, I did my residency at NASA University Medical Center. I was one of the three chief residents uh, uh, during my third year and part of my fourth year. And after that, I uh, ran the medicine residency program as an associate program director. Uh, I was truly interested in community medicine and primary care medicine. Uh, I worked for some time in uh, the NASA County clinics. I spent some time at uh, Newcastle Westbury Clinic when it was just being built up. And I went to that amazing facility uh, a few months back and I was uh, delighted to see all the wonderful things that they do there. And uh, after that, I went back and did my gastroenterology fellowship training. And as a full-time physician associated with NASA University Medical Center, uh, I feel I'm extraordinarily fortunate uh, to be making a difference in people's lives, not just as a physician, but also as a teacher, because NASA University Medical Center has a tremendous tradition of teaching medical students, residents, and fellows. Uh, and I'm, again, uh, really fortunate to be working with this entire group of uh, medical trainees. And I'm delighted to be here. I really thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak about the wonderful programs that NASA University Medical Center is doing for the sake of the community. So you mentioned the community and you mentioned the uh, clinics. Yes. So back in 1999, um, uh, the NASA University Medical Center was separated from the county. So it's no longer a county institution. It's a public benefit corporation, uh, Safety Net Hospital. And they had five clinics in different areas and some underserved areas. Yes. Um, and we, at that time, um, as part of the separation of the county, we um, took ownership of those clinics. They are now um, what they call FQHCs, Federally Qualified Health Centers. They are full service uh, primary care um, medical centers um, in some of the uh, underserved areas uh, of Nassau County. And they are also part of our system. Um, and
And that is a great um, segue because these are uh, facilities such as in uh, Newcastle or Roosevelt or um, Elmont. Uh, we also have Hempstead um, and uh, Freeport, which are available to patients. So patients can come to any one of those clinics um, and receive full services, including uh, gastroenterology, uh, cardiology. Uh, we even have psychiatric services there as well as dental. So we are really expanding uh, these, uh, these health uh, centers in these areas um, to provide care to patients that really, really need it. Um, so you, you said gastroenterology. So you did internal medicine, meaning that you went through three really intense years of internship and residency um, in all aspects of medicine. And then you went on to a fellowship. So what, what in, what's in, entailed in a fellowship in gastroenterology? Uh, fellowship is a focused training uh, in a subspecialty field. As you said, after three years of internal medicine training after your medical school, uh, you choose a subspecialty where, uh, in our case, it was gastroenterology, which is a study of diseases of the stomach, studies of the disease of the intestines, and studies uh, of the disease of the liver. Uh, so you uh, you get to see uh, a number of patients in an outpatient setting. National University Medical Center has a very busy outpatient practice. Uh, from which we get a number of uh, patients who need procedures. We get to do them in the endoscopy unit. And we also see uh, really complicated patients. Uh, you talked about the trauma program. We work very well with the trauma program, with the orthopedics department, with the cardiology department, with the intensive care units. And we are able to provide services in all these different areas for those patients uh, who need uh, treatment for any of the gastroenterological diseases. So after three years of fellowship training, uh, you have to be certified that you could perform all these procedures independently because it's gastroenterology, you perform a number of endoscopy procedures which involves uh, you know, putting a tube with light and camera through the patient's mouth or uh, through their uh, rear end and looking inside their body for any kind of diseases. Uh, and uh, NASA University Medical Center offers all these services, uh, really top-notch, uh, very high quality care, uh, and uh, it's, it's something that the hospital has continued to deliver and continue to grow. So gastroenterology is more the study of anything digestive yes. um, from your mouth, um, swallowing your esophagus, which is the tube, the food pipe that goes into your stomach. Um, then you have your stomach, which helps digest the food. Um, and then the food leaves from the stomach uh, with all the acids and ulcers and all these other things that can go yes. wrong into your small intestine, um, which is made up of three parts, yes. um, and into the large intestine. Yes. And then back out, uh, the food is expelled through the rectum, yes. an anus and rectum. Um, and and so the gastroenterologist is um, responsible or is the expert in all those diseases. In all those diseases. And also the liver, which has a lot of uh, you know functions in our body. It's a detoxifying organ. Um, it's an organ that's vital to life. Um, and it's an organ that can develop lots of different medical problems like yes. you know, hepatitis mm -hmm. and uh, liver disease, injuries. Uh, you know. Do you also have the gallbladder as well? Yes. And a pancreas we, to some pancreas extent? Pancreas too, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we... we take care of a lot of patients who have stones in their gallbladder, uh, and when they do end up passing a stone through the narrow tube, which is a biliary duct, mm -hmm. and if the stone gets stuck there, then we do an endoscopy to go into the mm -hmm. stomach and pull the stone from below. I like when uh, gastroenterologists say, what, what is that procedure called when you go through the duct? Uh, it's called uh, ERCP, but uh, some, <laughs> some call it rotor rotor as Rota. well. We go through the... Uh, <laughs> yeah. So... Um, so, you know, most people know that they need, at a certain age, um, you know, some checkup with the, with the doctor regarding their colon. Uh, we, you know, it's well known that colon cancer is a major killer. Uh, it's probably one of the, the most common cancers uh, that uh, people get and one of the top cancers that, that can possibly lead to, uh, to death. Um, and so you're not just a doctor taking care of colds and flus and, you know, you, you know other, you're, you're someone that's looking actively prior to someone coming down with cancer to find something that's suspicious or precancerous, such as a polyp, yes. and you get in there and you remove that um, and provide close follow-up with people to actually save their lives. And a lot of times you'll find the cancer and hopefully you'll get to the cancer early enough and you'll be able to then have it removed and again, follow that patient to keep that person alive. Yes. So it, it's one of these exams that we talk about, mammography where women must have mammography to identify a lesion 
early. Um, and at, at National University Medical Center, we have a women's health center, and we have what they call 3D tomosynthesis. So this is the latest, greatest uh, method for a mammography. Um, it's, it's probably one of the few. We actually have a van, uh, one of the few, I think only two in the state, that actually have a, a 3D tomosynthesis in a van. And we go to those federally qualified health centers. Uh, we go to different types of community events, and we offer those types of screening tests for women. And it's so important important for women to get these screenings for breast cancer because when we find it early, we're able to get in there and uh, if it's a cancer, remove it or treat it um, to uh, to save women's lives. Um, and the same thing with you. You yes. are in that same yes. uh, type of a position where if we get to you early enough um, and uh, you are able to do an endoscopy and find the lesion, um, yes. and you're able to remove it. So yes. tell us a little bit about that. Uh, colon cancer is one of the commonest cancers. Uh, it's the third leading cancer, and uh, more than about 150,000 adults are expected to be diagnosed with colon cancer every year. And unfortunately, 50,000 of those patients who are diagnosed die from the disease. Uh, and colon cancer, fortunately, if there's one good thing about it, is that it is one of those few cancers that has a precancerous condition. You talked about the colon polyp. Uh, all of us are predisposed to developing colon polyps. Once we, once we reach a magical age, whether it's 50 for everybody else, for African Americans, it's from the age of 45, you start developing these tiny bumps in, in, inside the body, uh, in the large intestine, and these can grow, up, grow out to be really bad cancers. Uh, a colonoscopy is a test that is indicated when a patient turns the age of 50 or 45. In those patients who are considered to not have any other risk, obviously, if a patient has a first degree relative, meaning a father, mother, brother, or sister, or even second degree relatives, uncles, aunts, and grandmothers and grandfathers have any kind of cancer, that they might be have to be screened a little earlier, depending on who has it and when they had the disease. But for everybody else, it starts from the age of 50. Uh, our 45, like I said, in African Americans. And colon ca colonoscopy is a very effective tool. It has been shown to save lives. And slowly the acceptance of the procedure has increased in the community. Uh, and uh, there is a major uh, effort going on in the country. It's called uh, uh, 80 by 18. Uh, currently our uh, you know, CDC released data that maybe more than one third of those patients who need colonoscopy uh, are not getting screened and uh, a consortium of medical societies put together uh, and made a pledge that uh, by the year 2018, uh, we should have about 80% of the patients who need to be screened will get the screening colonoscopy. And by doing so, we will be saving more than 200,000 lives. And this is a very, very important endeavor. And more than 1,000 organizations now have joined this effort. And colonoscopy as a screening initiative is slowly, staining, it's slowly gaining ground, and hopefully it'll lead to many more lives saved. And I think uh, uh, for a physician like me, uh, we have to continue to work very hard to, to make sure that every patient who needs to get screened gets the procedure. And the great work that is done by the county, NASA County, through its NASA County's uh, Department of Health that has a colon cancer screening program at NASA University Medical Center, uh, they are able to screen patients uh, from the general population who need the procedure uh, and get them the grant so even if they don't have the ability to pay for a colonoscopy, send those patients to us where we do the procedure. It's a wonderful program. It's run by uh, Chris Mancuso. Uh, Dr. Mostakia worked on it as well. So we have these patients that are, come, that are sent to us. We do the colonoscopy. And if we pick up anything abnormal, then they have a navigator who follows through and gets uh, the appropriate care for the patient. So uh, NASA County uh, and the NASA University Medical Center have done a tremendous effort and there's an ongoing effort. It's been going on for uh, close to 10 years now, and I think it's made a great impact in the community. So you said um, 45 years of age for African Americans, that male and female? Yes. And 50 for everyone else? Yes. So now you also mentioned if someone has a, uh, and that's for someone with no history, no, history. no family history. Yes. So everyone who's 45 or 50 um, 
should get this. It's life saving. I would like to say must. So. Must. must. <laughs> I, I, I agree. Must is a good word. It is. It's certainly, if you find a polyp and able to remove yes. it and then prevent this from becoming yes. cancer, it's a must. Absolutely a must. Uh, you also mentioned people that if their mother or father or first degree relative yes. had cancer, yes. when should they go for a colonoscopy? Okay. Uh, the, the latest that they can go for a colonoscopy is age 40. Mm -hmm. uh, if the first degree relative had a colon cancer, are diagnosed mm -hmm. uh, before the age of 40. Uh, it should be 10 years from the time that that person had the disease. So if you have a relative, then it will be uh, 10 years who ha if the relative had, say, colon cancer at the age of 35, unfortunately, then the person who's being evaluated should have the colonoscopy at the age of 25. Mm -hmm. uh, then there are very uh, significantly high-risk uh, diseases or conditions where you even start screening early. Uh, so uh, anyone who has any kind of remote family history must see their doctor, in some cases even a pediatrician, uh, so that they can start the referral to the appropriate specialist and get this thing going. For everybody else, uh, starting from the age of 45, uh, especially for African Americans, uh, we have done some studies at NASA University Medical Center where we found that African Americans uh, start from the age of 45. Uh, they they have more polyps. They have more polyps on the right side of the colon, and uh, they also, uh, in another study that we did, unfortunately have cancer and more cancer recurrence. So I mean. It gets a little complicated, but someone who has a family history of cancer, um, they need to see a physician um, because they could require colonoscopy as early as 25. Yes. If they have someone with uh, yes. some uh, polyposis type diseases yes. or uh, some familial history of yes. cancer. So if you have family history of colon cancer, you really should follow up with your physician. Yes. You can go to your primary care physician or your even your OBGYN and explain to them that you have this type of a problem uh, in your family and they will refer you to an endoscopist or gastroenterologist to have this uh, examination. Uh, but for everyone else, must by 50. And you know that is a very um, you know, ambitious goal uh, to get 80% uh, of the people in America screened by 2018. That's a year away. Uh, but I, I think that is a, some, it's, it's, a, it's something that needs to be done, and uh, you know, it's not a, it's not a very uh, pretty disease. I mean, it doesn't have all the, you know, the the fanfare, and there's not a lot of, uh, you don't see it on TV every, uh, you know, every 20 minutes. That hey, you need to get that uh, colonoscopy. And I think a lot of that's because people are afraid of it. Uh, they hear horrible things. They're like, oh my God, I can't eat I, uh, for a while. I have to take this horrible medication and it makes me go to the bathroom. I'm up all night with cramps. and So why, why don't you explain what's the procedure today? Okay. Um, say if I needed to have a colonoscopy um, and uh, and I've had colonoscopies uh, in the past and I'm actually due for a, a second colonoscopy and I, I'm actually making an appointment with my gastroenterologist, truthfully, uh, to get a second colonoscopy because you, you have to do it. Um, and uh, I had personally experienced, it was excellent. Uh, I really couldn't believe, um, you know, that I drank this uh, this mixture during the night and um, it didn't have any cramps, so I felt great. And the next day um, I went to the, the gastroenterologist and um, they put an IV in you and they gave me some medicine and I woke up and next I remember the nurse going, uh, you know, Vic, wake up, wake up, uh, get up and go to the bathroom. And I got up and I was like, wow, that was Stop. really amazing. I mean, I, it didn't hurt, I didn't feel anything, I, I felt great. I mean, I really could have went right have to went back to work after it, but I didn't. I went home, but you could, you know, because you had some of that uh, medicine still on, on your system, the uh, you know, sedation. Um, so, but it really was an, a painless, uh, you know, uh, really a pretty simple procedure. Um, and uh, you know, it's just that in our busy lives, people just don't take the time out to do the most important things, and that is to do these preventive medicine stuff. So, when. If I was your patient, how would you? How would I prepare, and what would be the procedure that you would do to, to do a, a lower end, a colonoscopy? Colon meaning from from the rectum up, as opposed to endoscopy, endoscopy which is through the mouth, through the mouth down. And yes. then you would go through the mouth down uh, to see uh, the esophagus yes. and the stomach ulcers and that type of stuff, yes. right? Yes. And from the bottom up, from the rectum anus up, to look at the uh, the colon, the descending, the transverse, the yes. ascending colon down to the cecum yes. uh, to look for polyps and masses and lesions and 
people who have some type of uh, um, maybe some sort of uh, other disease like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, right? You'll be able to see that as well when you do the, the scoping, correct? Yes. yes. So talk me through it. I'm doing sure. a lot of I, I just want to make a comment about uh, awareness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, colon cancer awareness is slowly picking up. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, March has been designated as a colon, careness, colon cancer awareness month. Uh, I recommend all of you, I rather request everyone, uh, first Friday of uh, March, please dress in blue. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the color for colon cancer awareness. Um, as far as getting the procedure itself is concerned, you are absolutely right. Uh, I, when I see uh, a lot of patients in the outpatient practice, uh, some of them have sort of seen some videos uh, on YouTube. Uh, they're aware of it. Some patients are really scared. Uh, like you said, the difficult part of the procedure happens to be the day before when you have to prep yourself. Uh, it's a process where, if you can imagine, you have to kind of fill the tubes. Uh, the small intestine is about 20 feet long. The large intestine is about another three feet feet long. So you have to kind of fill all of that with some fluid. So the patients do end up drinking uh, four liters of uh, fluid. There are many different prep types. The one that we recommend, unfortunately, uh, some patients do complain it's not very palatable, but we advise them to add a uh, Gatorade flavor of their choice, uh, provided it's not red in color. Uh, that complicates the, uh, the procedure when we do, uh, because if it's bleeding, we, we may not know. Uh, otherwise, it looks, uh, they, they, drink the pre- they drink the prep, uh, then they, they have multiple bowel movements. Uh, most of them honestly don't complain of cramps. They, they, they're not used to drinking that amount of fluid. Uh, but then the next day when they come in, they're a little nervous. Uh, but then once they see the familiar faces uh, in the endoscopy unit, uh, they are uh, calm. And like you said, the anesthesiologist comes in and gives them a very strong medication through the veins. And for that procedure, the anesthesiologist is just monitoring that patient alone. Uh, there are some uh, negative issues related to anesthesia where some patients think or some people out there think that the anesthesiologist starts the medication and walks away. No, for that, for the duration of the procedure, anesthesiologist is by the side of the patient. They stand on one side of the patient. We are standing on the other side of the patient and we're performing the procedure. So the procedure starts by inserting uh, a, a, a tube which has a high definition camera uh, with a light source and an, uh, and, uh, an air source into the Rectum, and we gently advance past all the twists and turns. Uh, it goes in about three feet into the patient's body. Uh, and we have to go into the very end of the large intestine, which is called the cecum. We have to take pictures to show that we are there. Uh, colonoscopy is one of those procedures where uh, you're mandated to show some quality data and guidelines, one, one of which is that you have actually performed the procedure, and then you do a careful job looking for at least about six minutes on the way back to identify these polyps. And once the procedure is done, the patient wakes up, uh, spends about an hour in the recovery room, and they are well enough to go back home. Uh, We do not recommend them going back to work. We do not recommend them driving for 24 hours after the procedure. And then I call them with the results, so they come and see me. uh, And uh, if everything goes well, they don't have to see me or do this procedure again for 10 years. So that's a big plus for Mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, really, I mean, it it seems to be a routine routine procedure, the fact that you have an anesthesiologist, not not the University Medical Center when you perform these uh, examinations, you have the anesthesiologist right there, um, and he provides that medication and the monitoring while you're under sedation and you perform your test. Um, If you remove a polyp, um, what, what does that entail, removing a polyp? So when you, uh, you, when you look at a polyp directly, it could be anywhere in size from a few millimeters to three, four centimeters. Uh, we are able to remove even large polyps, which uh, in the past used to be about two centimeters. Uh, if the polyp, some of these polyps look like a tree, which has a trunk, and then if you imagine the branches and the leaves, there is like a, a like a mushroom mm-hmm. sort of a cloud on top of that. So we are able to inject some medications into the base or in the trunk of the polyp, and then we're able to use certain devices that with electrosurgical cautery, we're able to remove it entirely. And then we send it to our pathology department, excellent group of people there who are able to call us uh, with any kind of uh, you know results, and then we follow up with our patients. And once they remove that polyp, um, then that risk of that polyp developing into a full-blown um, malignant cancer, yes. um, is, that, is that risk minimized? 
it's almost eliminated. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. When we lo- when we send a polyp uh, to the pathologist, the, mm-hmm. patholo- the, the pathologist actually looks to see if the margins are clear of any kind of tissue mm-hmm. that uh, would be bad news for the patient, and they would let us know. Mm-hmm. If it is remote, then depending on the type of the polyp, the next colonoscopy would be three years or five years, and in extreme cases, it could be a year. Mm-hmm. In some cases where we have a really large polyp, where we go at it with multiple attempts, we may have to repeat the colonoscopy in a few months, but it is something that the patient would not have known unless we did the colonoscopy, and then once they go through the process and once the polyp is entirely removed, then that risk is all eliminated. And, and that saves their life. That absolutely. And, and I think that's life. one of the major reasons that we're here talking today, um, and which I said at the opening of the show, was that we're going to talk to the listeners and tell them about a really simple procedure that involves you drinking a lot of uh, water or Gatorade the night before this procedure, which is uncomfortable, drinking a lot, um, don't eat the night before, and then the next day having this test performed. And that test, if it's we find something, it could save your life. And if it, we find nothing, then you don't have to come back for 10 years. For 10 years. And the key to remember is anyone 45 years of older, African Americans, or 50 years of older, uh, need to come in to you to make a phone call, one phone call, come in for a test, I guess to meet you first to get the medicine and you do a quick exam or an examination prior to the endoscopy, schedule the endoscopy, and then come back for the test and and move them on the merry way. Exactly. And it's men and women. See, women don't, you know, it's sort of misinterpreted. Oh, no, I, I went to my OBGYN. I had my pap smear, my cervix. I had my mammography. It's all done. But uh, this is so important. So, Dr. Rizvan, I, I, there's so many more questions I want to ask you. And everybody's waving their hands saying it's almost over. But there's so much more I want to ask you. I want to talk to you about liver diseases and inflammatory bowel diseases and gallbladder diseases. Uh, pancreas, so you have to come back. Definitely. All right? It'll be my back. pleasure. So I want to thank you very, very much for being here. Dr. Rizvan um, from NASA University Medical Center. I'm Victor Politi, um, and this has been Health Talk um, here um, uh, on 98.3 uh, KJOY Radio. And uh, we were, it was my pleasure to, uh, to talk to you this morning, and I, I wish you all a very, very happy and, and healthy day. Thank you. Thank you very much.